asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Let's have a look at what's been going on today. Now, the UK and the EU, you might have heard Rebecca Foster say this a couple of minutes ago, they have agreed on a large part of the agreement that will lead to the so-called orderly withdrawal of the UK from the European Union. Brexit negotiators Michel Barnier and David Davis said the deal on what the UK calls the implementation period was a decisive step, but issues still need to be resolved, including the border between the Northern, well, the Northern Ireland border with the Republic of Ireland. The transitional period will last allegedly from the 29th of March next year to December 2020. And both Davis and Barnier have said this will lead to a smooth or smoothening the path to a future permanent relationship. Barnier said there was also agreement on the rights of 4.5 million EU citizens living in the UK and 1.2 million UK citizens living in the EU after Brexit, including, and this is important, EU citizens can arrive in the UK during the transition period and they will be given the same rights and guarantees as those who arrived before the referendum. Do you hear that? The proposed deal will include an emergency backstop, that's a quote, backstop, that's an option to avoid a hard border, that could see Northern Ireland effectively staying in parts of the single market and the customs union if no other deal can be agreed. Do you see where all of this is leading? The BBC reports that this backstop option has been ruled out by Theresa May. Who said Theresa May was in charge? And any deal creating a difference between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK is opposed by her DUP allies and May wouldn't be governing at the moment if it wasn't for the confidence and supply agreement with the Democratic Unionist Party. You should know this. Brexit Secretary David Davis said it remained the UK's intention to achieve a partnership that was so close it didn't need specific measure for Northern Ireland. Here's the EU Chief Negotiator Michel Barnier voiced by an interpreter and then you'll hear Brexit Secretary David Davis. Have a listen. Here we go. The decisive step remains a step. Um, we're not at the end of the road. And there is a lot of work still to be done on important subjects, including Ireland and Northern Ireland. Make no mistake, both the United Kingdom and the European Union are committed to the joint report in its entirety. And in keeping with that commitment, we agree on the need to include legal text detailing the backstop solution for the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland in the withdrawal agreement that is acceptable to both sides. So while there is as yet no agreement on the right operational approach, we know what we need to do and we're going to get on with it. This is a sham. This is an absolute sham. The UK voted to leave the European Union in June 2016. This agreement keeps the country in the European Union until 2020 and not early 2020, but until December 2020. EU citizens can keep coming and will keep coming for another three years and will be afforded all the rights of those who came to the country pre-referendum. And what's worse, as you heard in the news there with Rebecca Foster, the UK will be subject to EU rules and regulations during the transition period. Think it can't get any worse? It does. It does. Fishing opportunities will continue to be negotiated by the EU during the transition period. Under this agreement, the UK fishing industry had expected that the UK would withdraw from the common fisheries policy on the day we leave, but it won't. The UK government has now agreed to be quote, consulted on arrangements with the EU and the EU will continue to set fishing quotas. The Scottish Fishermen Federation said this falls far short of an acceptable deal. This is a betrayal. 
It's not being reported as such. Nobody's criticising this. This is an outlandish betrayal of the decision made by the people of this country in 2016. We're never leaving the European Union. I've been saying it since the day after the referendum. We ain't leaving, ever. They might dress up some sort of situation where it looks like the UK is left, but it will have left in name only and be a proxy member or an associate member of the European Union. This is tyranny. What David Davis has agreed to is a tyranny. To stay in until the end of 2020, to follow EU rules and regulations during that time. For people to come as much as they want until the end of 2020, that's three years nearly, no stopping the open border, the open door madness that prompted so many people to originally vote to leave in the first place. You'll be hearing more of this in the coming days, 12 and a half minutes past the hour for Monday's programme. Dreadful this, and again, nobody's calling this out at all. No newspaper, not even the so-called Brexit newspapers, the papers supposedly with the editorial policy of supporting Brexit are not calling this out. More on it later on. UK Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson went to meet NATO General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg today and this was followed by a press conference full of unchallenged Russia bashing. Of course, this is all about the alleged poisoning of former Russian double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia. Here's Bojo the Clown speaking today just ahead of Jens Stoltenberg. We share the view that the poisoning of Sergei Skripal is not an isolated case, but the latest in a pattern of reckless behaviour by the Russian state. That behaviour goes back many years. From Russia's annexation of Crimea to cyber attacks and its involvement in the Syrian war, Russia has shown itself, the Russian state has shown itself, to have a blatant disregard for international order, for international law and values, our values. Yeah, our values. Interestingly enough, dear listener, after the press conference, no journalist asked Boris about the tennis match that he received £160,000 for, for playing tennis with the wife of a former Russian government minister and ally of Vladimir Putin. They've got goldfish memories, the press, of course, because this was only revealed in the last few days. Nobody wants to ask him about it. Let him stand there and demonise Russia and make all manner of allegations against Russia while he took 160 grand to play tennis with the wife of a former Putin ally. Not only that, but current Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson has taken 30 grand so that the same woman could sit alongside him at a dinner. Wonderful. Here's the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Have a listen. The attacks in uh, Salisbury was the first use of a nerve agent on Alliance territory. It showed a total disrespect for human lives and the attack was an unacceptable breach of international norms and rules. NATO allies have been united uh, in uh, condemning this attack and they have offered their support to the ongoing investigation. Yeah, of course, you wouldn't expect anything else from NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Alrighty. So Sky News presenter Kay Burley, the marvellous Kay, she chaired a debate today between Andrew Foxall, he's from the Russian Studies Centre, Andrew Foxall, and Andrew thinks the Russians are as bad as the Dothraki from Game of Thrones. He thinks they're a terrible race, the Russians. That's Andrew Foxall. Also in the debate was Alexander Nekrasov, former Kremlin advisor. We hear from Alexander Nekrasov first. Listen to this. This is fascinating. Well, uh, first of all, I must say I, I have heard all of these um, comments we just heard now that uh, Russia is very aggressive, 
and Russia is invading everybody. We are hearing it from people who invaded Iraq, destroyed Libya, are bombing Yemen at the moment, are occupying Ukraine where they shouldn't be there. And, and, and yet it's Russia. It's Russia that's the problem. You see, I think those Russian experts in the West need to understand something. They can't stick to the old cliches which they've been peddling since the, what, 1960s. You really need to change. And I think the situation is we have the West listening and hacking in Russia with the NSA scandal, other scandals, and so on. We have Western intelligence services doing whatever they want. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, they're, they're blaming Russia for, for, for all the sins in the world. Mm. Doctor, you're just being mean for blaming Russia. Yeah, stupid sarcastic excuse for a presenter, Kay Burley. Rubbish presenter, an embarrassment to the trade. Idiocy. You're just being mean to the Russians, she said, mocking what Alexander Nekrasov had said. Burley doesn't need to editorialise. She has the other guest on the screen. But she has to obfuscate, she has to lower the tone of the debate so that you don't hear the logic in what the former advisor to the Kremlin has said. So Andrew Foxall then from the Russian Studies Centre, what does he have to say? I would avoid sort of drawing the, the, the moral equivalence between what Russia is doing uh, in, in Eastern Europe uh, and towards the West and some of the issues that, that Mr Nekrasov has, has just outlined. It's perfectly possible, for example, to be opposed to um, the West's action in Iraq and uh, Russia's actions in annexing Crimea uh, and invading uh, eastern Ukraine. I don't think that the, what 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 I said and what others have said is a case of recycling cliches from the 1960s or or in the decades since then. Instead, it's it's based on a clear and realistic understanding of of what Russia has done over recent years. Yeah. Do you hear what he said there? He said it's perfectly possible to be opposed to the West's action in Iraq and also to condemn Russia annexing Crimea. But you see, guys like Andrew Foxall did nothing to stop the rush to war in Iraq and the slaughter of millions of people there and in Afghanistan. They were silent. They were absent. They never said a word. What bullshit. Now, to be fair to Alexander Nekrasov, the former Kremlin advisor, he eats the guy for breakfast and gives him a brilliant lesson in recent history. Well, I, I don't see Russia being aggressive in the sense that uh, Russia has been responding to the Western actions. The West has surrounded Russia. The West has taken over Ukraine where it crossed the line. What we're seeing in Ukraine is that the West is uh, 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 accusing Russia of invading Crimea, which, by the way, is Russian and has been Russian for centuries, and then invading the eastern Ukraine, but not saying about the coup uh, that, uh, that uh, the, 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 you know, the coup in Kiev when the West removed the legitimate government. Now, that I don't understand, how you can divide things like that. The West is um, involved in so many conflicts, in so many... Uh, actions that un undermine independent countries, and yet it's only Russia. And, and what I, I'd like to ask is this. If Russia is so active in hacking and cyber war, what are the CIA? What are they doing? They have $44 billion budget a year. They're just watching, looking at Russia and doing nothing. And what do other intelligence... I don't understand this game. Mm. Very good. Very good. Brilliant by Nekrasov there. So all that Andrew Foxall can do now, in the face of the history lesson he was given there by Nekrasov, Nekrasov reminded him that Crimea has been Russian forever, and that the change in government in Ukraine in 2014 was an orchestrated coup by Victoria Newland and her neocon pals. All that Foxall can do now is lie, and why does he lie? through his teeth. Um, the, the reason why the, the West isn't discussing or talking about a, a Western coup in Kiev is it, 
is obvious because simply there, there wasn't a, a Western coup in Kiev in, in, in 2014, in late 2013 or early 2014. This was the revolution, the Maidan revolution, the revolution of dignity in, in Kiev and Ukraine as a whole was very much a bottom up process led by Ukrainians who were appalled at the grotesque corruption that, that was taking place in their country. And that obviously fed into concerns, their own concerns about the future direction of their country vis-a-vis uh, Europe and Russia as well. Alexander? Well, I'm sorry, but five billion, Victoria Nuland even put a tag, a price tag on five billion on that so-called revolution. Please don't, don't treat us as idiots. I've been monitoring that so-called revolution. I've been calling both Kiev and Moscow and saying to them, guys, this is not some sort of a protest. These people are combatants. They're armed. Go to the Security Council immediately because this is going to be a coup. And unfortunately, that's what happened when in Kyiv, both in Kyiv and in, in Moscow, they were saying, well, they wouldn't dare. It's Ukraine. They know that the Third World War will start if they dare. Well, they did. And that's exactly what I warned them about. Okay. And I, I can tell you another thing, that Belarus is the next target of these so-called revolutionaries. And I, 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 I stopped telling, by the way, Moscow about it, because there's no point. So the aggression comes from the West. It's the Western troops that are on the border of Russia. It's not Russian troops on the border of the West. So thought, please Alexander. remember that. Please remember that, Alexander Nekrasov, I could kiss you. He took Burley and Andrew Foxhall to school there. And when he was talking about Newland and the five billion, you could hear Burley trying to get in there because there was a producer telling Burley to stop him, interrupt him. In Ukraine, as we've reported on, during the, the lifetime of this programme, Victoria Newland was behind the violent protests that we remember seeing those protests brought about to overthrow uh, uh, president Yanukovych, the Russian-friendly president, of course, and so that they could put in a US puppet government. Now, all the information is out there to prove this, even phone conversations that were recorded with Newland and the former ambassador to Ukraine, the American ambassador to Ukraine. All the paperwork is there. You might remember a guy called Karl Gershman. Remember him? the uh, president of the National Endowment for Democracy. He was anyway, I'm not sure if he still is. And back in 2013, if I remember, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post claiming that Ukraine was, quote, the biggest prize and an important step in getting rid of Vladimir Putin. Gershman said, quote, Putin may find himself on the losing end, not just in the near uh, abroad, but within Russia itself. Now, Newland... The wife of arch neocon Bob Kagan, remember Kagan, he was a founding member of the Project for a New American Century, remember him? Newland made sure that support reached anti-Yanukovych demonstrators in Ukraine. It was Newland who told Ukrainian business leaders that the United States had invested £5 billion in Ukraine's project to join the European Union. And it was Newland who told the ambassador at the time to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, that the new leaders of Ukraine should be men, including Arseny Yatsenyuk, who very quickly became the country's prime minister. Remember the phrase, Yats is the guy, she said. All of this is true. It was Newland who jumped all over the shooting in February 2014 when a sniper apparently fired from a building controlled by the right-wing sector group that shooting by that sniper which apparently killed police and protesters all of a sudden escalated the crisis everybody was all over it then Yanukovych agreed to having his safety was guaranteed by the EU he agreed to leave and he would accept reduced powers in the interim period and he would allow an early election be called so that he could be voted out of office do you remember all this? But that wasn't allowed to happen either because neo-Nazi militias overran government buildings. Yanukovych and his government pals ran for their lives. Thugs were now running the show. Victoria Newland's thugs. And she arranged for the procedure that stripped Yanukovych of the presidency 
and declared the new regime, seeing as they love the word regime, to declare the new regime legitimate. And just to remind you, her man, Arseny Yatsenyuk, became Prime Minister. All of this is true. Vladimir Putin realised this was going on and the threat, it, the threat this represented to Russia, so he secured the naval base at Sevastopol in Crimea. And of course the West sold that as Russia has annexed Crimea. He didn't annex Crimea. Crimea was Russian forever. He had no choice but to take those measures in light of everything else that had gone on in the previous 15, 20 years, 25 years. This is the truth, you see. This is the truth. This is the black and white balls to the wall truth of what's happened in Europe and in Ukraine and in Russia in the last five, six, seven years. But you can't know that. You're not supposed to know that. Burley, as in Kay Burley, was in some form today. She interviewed Marina Litvinenko. Now, some of my friends have noted that Marina Litvinenko, the wife of Alexander Litvinenko, allegedly killed by polonium poisoning, in London, you remember, um, Russia was blamed for the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko, although no definitive proof was ever offered. So she's been on every television and radio program in the last two weeks, has Litvinenko, this is true. Kay Burley interviewed her, and strangely, bizarrely, Burley wanted to know what Marina Litvinenko thought of Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn. Can I ask you what you thought about Jeremy Corbyn? Um, and some of the comments that he made in the House of Commons last week. I can't say people naive, but sometimes I hope is nothing behind of this because I don't like to blame people of being uh, corrupted or doing this because of money, what is very common when you're talking about Russia politics. But again, sometimes when you meet people, they try to think about Russia in a, in a better way. And when they try to give Russia another chance, or when he doesn't believe it might happen in Russia, I just try to understand what he was being motivated of his uh, feeling he loves Russia or because somebody asked him to do this. Really difficult. No, for me, it's difficult to blame him. Do you think he's naive? Mm -hmm. It would be very strange to say about politician for a long time in a politics to be naive and difficult, you know. Yeah, Litvinenko says Corbyn loves Russia or someone has told Corbyn to be sympathetic to Russia. And in the absence of Jeremy Corbyn, you have to say as a presenter, hang on, maybe he doesn't believe there's any evidence. It doesn't mean that Corbyn is a traitor. But this is the media in 2018. Many times have I said that. Now, author and former UK ambassador Craig Murray has said that the British government has pressured its own scientists to prematurely blame Russia. Here is Craig Murray speaking with RT. Yes, the, the language used has been very carefully formulated because the scientists at the UK's um, laboratory at Porton Down, which handles chemical weapons, refused to say this nerve agent was made in Russia. The British government put them under heavy pressure to say this nerve agent was made in Russia, and they said there's, there's no evidence it's, it's made in Russia. Um, so in the end, a formula was agreed, which was that the nerve agent is of a type developed by Russia. Now, what does that mean? It's very interesting because the NATO communique said it was of a type developed by Russia. Uh, May said in Parliament it was of a type developed by Russia. The UK said to the UN Security Council it was of a type developed by Russia. And today, if you look at the EU statement, it says it is of a type developed by Russia. They always use um, you know, exactly the same formulation. Well. Uh, antibiotics were developed here in Edinburgh first. You know, penicillin is of a type developed by Scotland, but it doesn't mean all penicillin is made in Scotland. Yeah, very good point. He then reminds us, this former ambassador Craig Murray, and this has been ignored by every news outlet in Britain, he reminds us that making Novichok is a cinch. The formula has been available through Amazon Jesus Christ, it's in a book that is for sale on Amazon. Uh, but the... Um alleged uh, chemical formula for producing Novichoks was published. Mm. You can buy it from Amazon. It was published 12 years ago in a book. 
And the Iranians, with OPCW supervision, mm -hmm. synthesized uh, Novichoks in uh, 2016. Uh, so many people can make this. The fact is of a type originally developed by mm. Russia, if, if that is true, uh, is nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that, but it doesn't matter because our fourth estate is absent. Russia today, and of course there will be those who are sceptical and will say, well, Richie, of course, Russia today is going to feature people like Craig Murray. And I'm not an idiot. You're not an idiot. I don't treat you like an idiot. I know that. We know what Russia today is likely to do in these instances. It's likely to find people and give prominence to people who are questioning this. But the UK media, apart from the occasional appearance by somebody like um, the former Kremlin advisor who spoke with uh, Sky News today, Nekrasov, but apart from that, right across the board over the last two weeks, you've not seen hardly any criticism of the UK government, any criticism of Boris Johnson, Theresa May, and everybody else who's making out the Russians tried to poison this guy and offering no evidence to support their theories. So you can understand why Russia Today is doing what it's doing, how long Russia Today will be operating within the UK, I have no idea, because the calls to ban it are getting louder and louder and louder.